All right, I'm going to get started for the sake of time. Every once in a while, you might hear me feeling like I am getting off task because I'm trying to admit people in. Uh, Katie Ling is going to be here in a little bit. She's at another meeting. I am Lisa Scompiero. I am one of three digital integration specialists. Katie will be coming as well, and Kim Peer will be here as well. Um, this is on maximizing office hours during the virtual hours that you might have that you are trying to establish with students. And we are hopefully going to give you some tips and tricks that will help you. We are splitting this section into beginners, intermediate, and advanced. And the reason that we're doing that is because it seems like a lot of people may need to go at increments to understand how to do this. So we're just gonna give you several different ways. And I'm going to first start off with our objectives. We're gonna discuss any hurdles you're having as well as, as successes with office hours during distance learning. We're going to survey several options for maximizing those office hour times. We're gonna share some learning moments and next steps, and then we'll have you complete a Google form. If you've taken several of these, this is a separate Google form. It goes for the maximizing office hours. It's not connected to the two other ones that we're running. And then Joni Burkhart will come on and make sure you are able to do your digital signature. Most of you, if you've taken the course or one of the courses prior, you'll know how that works and how the email will work and everything. And she'll go over that towards the end. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna just talk about some hurdles and successes you're encountering during distance learning concerning maximizing office hours. So if you want to unmute your mic and share that. I'll also monitor the chat to make sure that if anybody wants to talk about it. So I'm going to talk about how to work with your office hours. Somebody had asked about being an encore teacher and they have a lot of students. So I will make sure that that is discussed. Kids do not show up when offered an additional Zoom meeting even when they request it. And that's something that we have heard. I know that my son had uh, Zoom meetings with his Algebra One teacher, and he said it was really weird, Mom, because we, we met as a, a class, and she was talking to me saying how cool my lights were in my bedroom, and he was like, it was just really weird, Mom. And so he doesn't like to show up for the office hours because he feels like he's gonna be alone in the room with her in the Zoom room. Um, and I'm like, well, you know, you could always do ask for another group or have one of your friends or jump on, but he'd rather email her, he said. So that was one of the things. Um, some people say they agree, they offer help and uh, students don't show up. Kids think it's weird for to FaceTime their teacher, correct? My, my daughter even the other day, she said my teacher the whole time talked about, and she's eight, for an hour her teacher went over math and sharing stories and she was like I just wanted her to talk to me for a little bit about what, what I was doing at home and and find out what she's doing and show us her dog. She just wanted that connection with her teacher. It says parents are emailing and contacting in the evenings rather than day. We find that as well. We also find that with the uh, feedback forms, they like to hit the feedback form at like midnight. Um, <laughs> and I don't see it till the next day. Um, having a help Google form posted in classroom, that's a good idea. I can get the email notification even when I'm not sitting at my computer. I am gonna show something with a Google form, so that's awesome. I also have people, students and staff alike, call me anytime, any day of the week. I try to be available but it's frustrating to be on a walk with my family and my phone is blowing up, I know. I actually made sure that anytime that I'm using anything, I just use the Google Voice. I don't use my actual phone. And then I also have found that I have to eventually at some point say, I'm not checking it till the morning. I'm just not checking until the morning. Now, if I get a text from my supervisor and she says, check your email, I'm gonna check it. But otherwise, I am done. And then breakout rooms during office hours. That's great. That's a great way of using it. Have them go and maybe have little chats with one another and then go in and talk to each group. 
I know some people are doing that with some students that they feel like the students are having difficulty in certain sections so they'll put them in breakout rooms and work with them during those office hours so I've heard that as well and then let me just check the chat again I saw one thing in there and it says I got a lot of emails initially at all parts of the day but since the students seem to have the swing of things now they've calmed down yeah except for the stragglers that haven't even started yet I could see that because if you teach ninth grade most definitely and the main thing to remember in all this is, you know, that flexibility. I think one thing that when I think of virtual office hours or office hours, I always think about those college professors that had their office hours and how sometimes I could not actually get in a hold of them until during those office hours. And when I went, they were always working on something. And so we're going to talk about some of that stuff so that sort of helps you. I know that time is valuable. I know that we have virtual office hours, but I try to just have people email me and be like, when do you, when do you need me um, so that I don't have that Zoom on all the time. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. For Zoom. I'm just going to go over a few things. Uh, we were talking as a digital integration team. We were talking about like setting up clear times with students. Tell them what you're talking about or answering questions about. Actually have an agenda that you might want to just put up so that they know exactly what will be covered. Also, we talked about that it shouldn't be that long of a Zoom. You don't have to have a full hour Zoom with students for your office hours. It could be a very brief one. I know some teachers are saying they're also making the Zoom with possible topics that have some things to do about the actual agenda and the class, but other things are fun things things to talk about, or if you come to the office hours, maybe you can learn something, um, you know, and then afterwards play a game or talk about something. So I know a lot of the kids need that relationship time. I always think of these virtual office hours almost like you're in your planning period, you're sitting at your desk and a knock comes at the door and it's just like a kid that needs to talk or ask a question. And sometimes those are the kids that need these virtual office hours. So we'll talk about some other things other than just Zoom. Um, you can also send out like a teaser video for the week. And something that my church is doing, my pastor is sending out teasers during the week and he's in different parts of the church and he's like, guess where I'm at? Do you know who painted the wall? Do you know like all this stuff and, and just showing different things to the uh, church members and then you know he's trying to draw you in and give you like a little scripture lesson but like you're really watching it just to see you know where is he but then you also get a little bit more and you could do that too you know look where I'm at um, I'm outside by my apple tree they're you know getting flowers right now and then you could say and by the way this is how I would always start in an introductory paragraph and just like slip it in a little bit so that they get to see that type of teaching happening the next thing is we're going to go over these this would be beginner so what we were thinking about doing and it's just circling so i'm just going to move to the uh, communication doc and then i'll show it to you we made sort of a chart beginner intermediate and then we made the uh, bottom part and one of the things we've been hearing is a lot of students cannot come to the zoom sometimes because they're working, they are an essential employee, they're working for a grocery store or something else where they have to go to work. Some have to watch siblings, some have to go to a daycare and they have to sit at daycare all day and the daycare doesn't have any of that information for them because they can't do that. Also, they may not have some of the things that 
students might need like the support. So they're at a daycare, they can do their work, but if they have a question, those people aren't there to help them. So how you can maximize your office hours, I think some of you may have seen students do this. They make a Google Doc and they communicate back and forth with one another. Sometimes they make different fonts and they talk back and forth and they have a little key at the top. They get very intricate, intricate with all of this. The same thing here, you could make a Google Doc, you could put it in your Google Classroom at the top and call it virtual communication and you could actually have the students with the date, the question or comment, and then they could also put a link to a screenshot or a file. Like some kids, it's just, I can't find or I can't open. And if they can show you something, you'd be able to see that. You could put this in the Google Classroom for each student. So each student has a copy. And when you open up Google Classroom, anytime that you create a doc, for each student, you know that when you look at the document, you could sort of see when it has been started to be filled out. You could sort of see a couple writings on it. And then you could check them to see if anybody's virtually communicating with you. I haven't done it, but I heard of doing it. And I think as the library media specialist, it would be beneficial to set one up at the elementary school in each class. Um, that way they can reach out to me easily um, it's not easy for them to get a hold of, if I'm talking about a student, it's not easy for the student to get a hold of me with a quick question. So I think that might be beneficial for me to set up. Yes, and it would depend upon if you want to make it every student's on the document and they add their own thing because again, you can see their revision history or are you going to do it in such a way that you have students have one per student and if you have a shared Google Classroom or you have your own Google Classroom, you go in and you check this periodically and just see if anybody's added anything to it. And again, this might be something better than the private comments or better than, you know, sitting during a Zoom waiting for somebody that doesn't come because they don't have any questions. But if they do, you could always comment back to them and say, why don't we set up a Zoom, come to my virtual office hour or something like that, or just answer the question for them, dependent upon if the student can do that or not. Uh, also, somebody said my students love to do this. They know it is the easiest way to get a hold of me. Good. Um, so that is, that's really good that Elizabeth said that because one thing that students like is to have something that they know, how can I get a hold of my teacher? And is it going to be a Zoom? Is it going to be email? How do they usually respond? So this is an easy way. This is a be very beginner way, but you can make it more complex. You can have more parts of the chart. And just to make sure, because we want to make sure everybody's there with us to create a table, you can make as big as a table as you want. And then you can start to get creative and color in the different ways and have them do whatever they want with that. So it's really up to you how you do that. So that is one way. Uh, another way that we have on this infographic is Google Classroom. So the main thing we said here is the teacher can comment to students, but students can also use a private comment to ask questions and discuss assignments on their own time. This becomes really a difficult thing to do if you have a lot of kids asking questions all day, because if you have your notifications on, you get a lot of information and it comes in and in droves. So one thing you could do is have something here in your materials section and have something where the students would maybe the syllabus, they would click on it. And when they actually view the assignment, the student, whenever they click on it, they would be able to, to send you a private message. And if you're getting one from the syllabus, if you would tell them, if you send it from the syllabus, then you know it's, it's a question that is a, an overarching question. If you are having them send it from the actual assignment, then you know it's an assignment question. But again, that's if you're okay with getting all kinds of emails because you're getting additional emails on top of that. But that is a way to communicate with students. 
And another way is to, to teach them, you know, how to ask those questions. You might have in here, we're gonna talk about it later, is a Google form. You might have a Google form like this, where you say, if you can't meet me on Zoom during my office hours, I'm always available. And so you could just ask me introductory question, like, how are you doing? I mean, some kids just need to vent and be like, it's a crappy day, nothing's working. <laughs> I'm having trouble with all this technology. Can't figure out where, where my assignment is. Um, do you have any assignment questions this week? If so, what can I help you with? Do you have a screenshot and have the ability for them to add the file? And then which assignment did you enjoy the most this week and why? Or ask them something like, you know, what was something fun you did this week? So it's all those different things and layers that you can put into your Google Classroom to sort of help the students see that. And then I'm gonna get on the chat. We use this to group students for office hour breakout rooms, good. And Susan Day had said that. So you use the Google Forms to group students no, we use the common, uh, not the Google Forms. I, I sent this before you started this. Oh, okay. We use the common document, and that way when we, um, we, we Zoom at the same time, my three teammates and I, and then we can um, offer breakout rooms during our meeting out office hours. And so if you need ha help with line plots, everybody goes in that breakout room. If you, you need help with rulers, everybody goes in that. If you um, don't understand the ELA questions, you go in a different room. So students can, you know, we as a, the four of us um, can decide, okay, you take these three, I'll take those three. And it works very well. That's awesome. And then it's nice because you could even, you know, move around if you guys wanted to, to the different rooms. But I like that because that gives you an opportunity for the students to ask those questions honed in on that area. And they're not waiting because they already know what the one section is. They just want to know about the other section. So that's good. I like that. And again, you can set up any sort of document or any part of your Google Classroom in a way to communicate that you're there, um, that you want to help them. You can have a class calendar and you can go ahead and have your Zoom class code and password right here so that you can show them this is, you know, my office hours and you can have everything set up so that they know exactly where everything is and it's in their materials. And so you'd be able to have all of that. Another thing with Zoom, I had found this, and Anders actually shared this with me, and I thought it was a really uh, immediate thing. She shared it with me actually last week when we were going to share with lead teachers. So I thought it was really awesome. And while it's coming up, I'll just talk about what it says here. It's an agenda of your virtual hours for the week and possible topics for students to choose from. And what's nice about it, once it pops up, is it gives you different ways that teachers are using it. And some of it, you can just like create the template yourself. Um, so it's really nice to have that. Also with the Google form, while we wait, because I do see it here, I will show you when I created this Google form, I went to responses. And what I did is one thing I'd like to do is I always like to create it in sheets. So when I go back, I create it in sheets. What I like to do then, and what one thing I like to do is I like to text wrap it so I can see everything, what the whole question was, what the whole answer is for the students so that they know exactly what it looks like. Another thing that I like to do is I like to go up here to the three dots and click get email notifications for new responses. Then I immediately know when that is filled out. And if I have multiple forms that I'm using, what I also will do is I'll make something very similar to this. And what I'll have on this is the name of the class, the name of the form, and then the, the, the Google Sheet that goes with the form. And then I can just click on it and I don't have to go to forms, I don't have to go to sheets, everything's there. And I just click on what I have and I could have a little chart for myself and I could be looking at that. And then you can also go beyond a Google form. Like for example, if you have multiple people asking the same question, you might go ahead and you can always sort 
So you can go to a column and if all of them are saying like it's fine or nope, but then you have questions where students are asking the same question, like she was saying, put them into breakout rooms, then you can actually sort them and sort them, you know, A to Z or whatever. And when you sort them, you'll be able to see the same common answers. And then you can pull those students or go back into Google Classroom and then create an actual material for them or assignment. And when you do the assignment, you just click on the students that are having the difficulty and you send it to them. And then they all get like a, an assignment or materials that are going to help them with that question that they had sent out on the Google form. So that if they can't meet with you, they're still meeting with you. It's just a back and forth and it's asynchronous instead of synchronous. So you're still meeting with them, but you're not necessarily with them at that moment. I am going to right now just pause for a minute to see if you guys have any questions. You can add those in the chat. This is still not, oh, there it loaded. So this was what she was showing. Somebody was showing a virtual meeting whiteboard and they basically had their agenda. They had a check-in. So actually the students showed up to the Zoom. She has the code up here. And then what she had was, it was probably dropped in Google Classroom. She had a check-in for them. And then she said exactly what they were going to do and they were going to follow that agenda. And what I liked about that is then students knew we're gonna eventually have open topics at the end. I'm just gonna do these things for right now. So that was nice. Um, you can get copies of these in here. I don't know why they're not loading right now, but there are several examples of how they customized and used their different whiteboard templates. But it was a really neat article about having that virtual meeting. The next thing that we're gonna go over are advanced options. So with the advanced options, there's two things that you could possibly set up for virtual office hours. One would work really well because it's a back and forthness to it. It's called Flipgrid. I know that some of you may be familiar with it. What I did was I made this PD module for distance learning so that you can see how everything is set up and you'll get this whenever I send you everything. This will have the written directions as well as the videos. They're very short and to the point. One thing that Flipgrid will do is you can screencast and that is something that's close to Screencastify that it's gonna look like. Screencastify is five minutes, Flipgrid is 10 minutes. And so Flipgrid has extended their time during this time. I think they're gonna have difficulty making it lower <laughs> after this, but they are uh, 10 minutes. And also you can moderate the topic. So what you can do is you can make sure that the topic is moderated and you don't have to worry about students saying something inappropriate because you're only going to see it. So for Flipgrid, I'm just gonna show you quickly how to get onto it. The videos will show you a little bit more in detail. If you have not ever used it, you'll sign up. I log in, I log in with my Google single sign on. Once I'm in, I'm going to have way more than you are, um, unless you've used it before. These are grids, and so all I have to do is right here, say that I'm gonna add a new grid. I'm going to go ahead and call it virtual hours. I'm always going to require a school email, and I'll explain why in a moment. And then this will be the flip code, but we don't need it quite yet because they do say it several times during the creation process. As you see, I already have our w at wcps.k12.md.us in here. The reason why you wanna do this is to make sure if students share this code with their friends and be like, you know, get on and just tell my teacher, hi, they're not gonna be able to unless they're a WCPS student. And then also you're gonna have it moderated. So you're gonna to go to next. 
You could copy this if you want to. Some people, when I talked about Flipgrid um, to other teachers last week, they said sometimes they share this and then the students go to the grid always in their materials section on their Google Classroom. And then whenever they go in this way, they can go to any topic. They'll be able to see the topic that they're supposed to go to. Other teachers will just put the topic. So I'll explain. So the grid, we're gonna go to it. That is just right now, all I have in the grid is this one. They always have the say hello. If you want the students to practice for the first time, you may leave it here. If you're like, no, I think I'm gonna get rid of it. You can get rid of it by checking it and going to actions. You can delete it. You can also hide topics or freeze them. Freezing topics means they're no longer going to get submissions, they're finished. You can also hide it so the students can't see it or you can activate it. So we'll go ahead and delete it so I can show you. They'll always ask you if you want to permanently delete it. And now we don't have any topics. So we have a grid. It's almost like we have an outline, but we don't have any lessons in it. So right now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a new topic and we'll go ahead and call it geometry. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose our time. So right now you can go up to 10 minutes, but do we really want students talking for 10 minutes? It just depends. So maybe we'll say five minutes. You always have to have a prompt. What questions do you have? Question mark. Then you go down here. You can actually record a video. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you. Here I am in my sunroom. You can also have different filters. The kids like this because they can pixelate themselves. I love this when I have to do a flip grid and I have just gotten a shower. Uh, so it's just one of those things where you don't have to show yourself if you don't want to. The kids sometimes do not, especially the older kids. You can also talk about mood and theme and they can go into different um, sepia and black and white. They can also have a whiteboard or a blackboard. So they can actually write on the board. They have stickers, they have different things, but they can write on the board. I have to get the drawing so that it comes up. I'm on a Mac, so it's really hard to do. It's easier when they have the touch screens. And they can also do text. They can bring in a, a, a picture and actually annotate on the picture while they're recording and talking. Right down here where the three dots are, this is where the screen recording is. If I click on this, it's going to act just like Screencastify. You're going to click on it. It's going to say your entire screen. That means you're going to be able to go between tabs and show things. You're going to click share. It's going to give a three, two, one. Down here, it's going to say stop sharing. But right now, this is the thing that you have to sort of think about. Here I am, do you see me down the corner? I need to move to a tab in order to record something. Otherwise, I'm just recording this capturing your screen screen. Um, so it's sort of like the iPads when the kids are doing the uh, screen recording and it does a three, two, one, it's still blurred out and you're sitting there going, what am I supposed to do now? So you'd actually have to go and start talking about the virtual office hours Google form or something like that. Um, another thing that um, you should look at here is you should be able to see um, that when you hit stop sharing, you're going to have the video, you're going to click next, you can take a picture or you can choose a sticker, you can put it over your head, <laughs> which a lot of kids do, believe it or not, they take the picture, they go to next, and then that's preparing your video. You're not gonna close it until it's ready. And then when the students actually go to your topic, they're gonna see your video. And it might be like, hey, how are you guys doing this week? You know, whatever. And then I'm gonna see what this is down here, complete. I'll click complete. And now I'm gonna have that as my focus area. If I delete this as my focus, because I just wanna show you what else is there, you can also put a YouTube video, you can um, do a Kahoot, 
you can have a lot of other things in there. I used to put gifts in there just to like, you know, mix it up a little bit. Another thing is since we're working virtually with students, you might want to do like a topic tip, like remember what I told you guys about your conclusions and at the very end here too, you can give them a link to a document and that document will be able to be seen by them. One thing you do want to do is you want to do video moderation. Now the reason why you want to do video moderation is because we have said that students shouldn't be recorded. 13 and over is a little bit more forgiving, but 13 and under, we want to have that video moderation. And then student to student replies, then we don't want, but everything else stays the same here. If you're okay with them taking selfies and videos, it's okay. But if you're just like videos only, um, they can go ahead and add, you know, on the videos, they can add selfies, but I mean, uh, uh, stickers and drawings, but on the selfies, they can't. So you can do that or you can choose to not do that. Also over here, um, likes should be turned off and you might want to do the view count off too because a lot of kids, it's like how many likes they have or how many people looked at it and they get really crazy about that. You can add a rubric. This is just a, a basic one, but you can customize it and then you can use ones that you've used before and check it and also edit it. You'll create the topic. This is the topic copy. You can always give them a QR code or the actual shortened URL here. You'll hit all set. And one thing you'll notice right here is you'll be able to see what the student sees. So if you click this and view it as a student, which I love, you click on it, you don't even have to like go in with a different account or anything. That's how the students would log in. You can show them during the Zoom how they would do it. This is how your grid would look. Down here is geometry. When you have more than one topic, they'll lay on top of each other like right here. And then the question says, what questions do you have? They can go ahead and click the plus button and then they can start to record. I'm going to show you one where I'm going to go back. What I'm showing you now is just a different grid. This is an actual like one that I had just put in here that I was just playing with when I made the video. And this is how you'll see it. You'll see that it's hidden. So the students is not, it can't be seen. If you choose it to be active, then other students will be able to see it if they go into the grid. So sometimes you have to ask the student if you can show it, if they had a really good explanation and you wanna use that. Now with this, what I'm doing is I have their video. I can give them video feedback. So I can click on it and I can start a video and talk right back to them. I can do a rubric and grade them on their ideas and performance. I can type comments to them and then afterwards what I can do is I can copy that feedback link put it in Google Classroom and then when they click on it they can actually see their actual response and then they can see what I responded back to them so they get to see that back and forth and that's going on so it's a really nice thing because it's asynchronous but it is something that if you aren't getting the responses from students, maybe making something like this, they'll see that they can get on anytime and speak with you. I know when my son was in, I think fifth grade, he's in ninth grade now, they had the strike in West Virginia, it was fifth or sixth grade and he had viola. This is how they did their practices for every night to show their teacher that they were practicing for the concert. Um, since they were out for a while. So that was a nice thing for them to be able to go back and forth and see each other. It is a little bit more involved, uh, but it is something that if you're willing to set it up, but you'll see the videos, it's not too, too bad. And one thing you can do, you can jump on and you can play with it. You can download the app on your phone and you can see how it works prior to, so that you can tell the students. Uh, I see something is in the chat. I just want to make sure. Any suggestions for how an Encore teacher would organize these for, for, by many classes? Should we do grids by grade? Oh, that's a good question. 
You might want to do it by grade, um, if, especially if you're moderating it, you're not going to have to worry about students seeing it. I know that they, they have a whole bunch of up here. I'm going to show you. I'm just going to get out of here. In this disco library, does not have John Travolta in it, but it does have a lot of really great ideas. You might want to search and see how different people do different types of grids. Um, I have a couple of my English ones in here, but it's a really nice way to see how people arrange things. Uh, but I would say perhaps do it by grade, the grids, um, maybe even groups. You know, you could do like A through K and then L through, you know, P, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of my alphabet right now and I can't even do that. Uh, so, but that's one of the things that you could do. All right, the other one is Blogger. This would be used by the teacher to communicate with students. You could also use Google Sites. Uh, Google Sites, I, I also put that on there and I have another thing. Blogger is just a part of Google. It's not part of G Suite. You don't want the students to create a blog because you would only be able to do 13 and over. But if you have, if you create one, students can respond. So for example, I made one here called virtual office hours. I just started to, to make it look like this for right now. I have the week of, and that was last week. So I can go ahead and change it to the 27th. I can go over some of the stuff. I can have my office hours off to the side. And when I go to preview, it looks like a web page. And I can actually have things like off to the side so everybody can see the blog archive and different things like that. But students can post and add comments down here. And I get emails to that. So if I go back to Blogger and I go and hit close and I go to settings, I can go ahead and decide down here, uh, maybe posts and comments, there we go. I can always say that I want users with Google accounts because that's what we have with our students. Comment moderation, always. And then I don't have to worry about kids posting things. I can have them show seven posts at most on the page. I can make it more. I can also say how many days I want it on the main page and then it goes away. So I could say, I'm gonna just do it for you know the seven days and then I want another page to come up and that would be my next page. And so it does take a little time getting used to it because it is more of a, if you've ever done the, where before they had the Google sites where you did more of an HTML and building a site, it's set this way in your mind, but they do have different layouts. They do have different ways that you can add stuff. You can have an about me area. You can have anything that you want. You can have footers and navigation bars and different things on there. And they have different themes and you can look at the themes and choose them. So it's a really nice thing to do, but you're using it and just try to keep that in your mind. This would be something for you as a communication piece with your students just like you could do a Google site as well and communicate with your students and just give them like a heads up of what they're doing. So it, it, I, we heard from the content specialist that a couple teachers made a Google site just with some things, um, highlighting some of the things in their classes and that made a difference for the parents because what we're noticing is a lot of the parents are accessing the material on their phones or an iPad. And if you guys think about it, what are most things that we look at? We look at websites a lot. We look at informational things a lot. Google Classroom is very different for some parents because they've never seen it. And if they have a child that can't explain to them, yes, this is how we use it, they may have difficulty with it. So just being able to give them different ways to access the material and for the students too, might be good as well. So I'm gonna to go to the chat. 
Uh, somebody, Melissa Delaney, use s'mores. Yeah, that would have been awesome too. Carrie Stevens said that. Another thing you can do too is when you set up your, your blog uh, or your web page, is you can have you know students respond to a question. So you can have a question of the week and students can respond to it that way as well. To access the infographic, please scan the QR code or go to the shortened URL.